Coming up on this Tuesday edition of Newsline at Noon, facing a strong political backlash, the government and the ruling party have agreed to exclude people earning 50,000 U.S. dollars or less from a tax hike plan. Authorities are keeping tabs on the nation's electricity demand for the second straight day as mercury levels in the country are expected to climb to nearly 40 degrees Celsius. Power reserves are expected to hover near dangerous levels during peak hours. Plus, rising labor costs is reportedly prompting General Motors to cut production here in Korea, where the car company makes a fifth of its global output. These stories and more on Newsline at Noon. Where's the best place for beef and bop? Les Jeux Olympiques d'hiver se dérouleront-ils à Pyeongchang Korea is attracting interest from around the world. The more you know, the more you want to know. Dynamic Korea. Thanks for joining us. You're watching Newsline at Noon. I'm Chi Yusan here in Seoul. Good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. Four days, just four days, after announcing a tax code overhaul that sparked almost instant mass disapproval, the government said Monday that it will give the plan another look. And now the government and the ruling party are in talks to make the plan less of a burden on the middle class and low-income households. Our Kim hyun reports. The tax code proposal that was made last Thursday was forecast to increase taxation on some 4.3 million salaried workers, with an annual income of more than 31,000 U.S. dollars. But the finance ministry says it's now looking into increasing taxes on workers earning more than $45,000 a year. The ruling Senate party proposed raising the baseline to this new level. Finance Minister Hyun Wo-suk said Monday that his ministry will rewrite the tax code proposal just four days after it was announced. From the get-go, the government's initial proposal drew heavy criticism from the opposition party and workers, who said the plan favored the rich and large businesses. We will re-examine the entire tax code from scratch so as not to increase burden on middle and working class people. If the baseline gets adjusted to increase taxes on people earning more than $45,000 a year as proposed, some 2.5 million workers will have to foot a bigger tax bill. That's about 1.8 million people less than the government's initial tax plan would have affected. The adjustment would also mean tax revenues falling by about $270 million. To make these changes possible, the finance ministry is looking into making adjustments to income tax deduction rates and tax credits. However, Finance Minister Hyun said Monday that his ministry will not adjust the tax base so as to collect more taxes. Kim hyun Arirang News. Korea's customs agency collected about 2.2 billion U.S. dollars less in import duties during the first half of this year compared to last year. Korea Customs Service said Tuesday that it collected $28 billion in tariffs during the first half compared to $30.7 billion tallied during the same period last year. The agency says the large drop comes with a drop in value-added taxes levied on import items due mainly to Korea's free trade deals with some of its major trading partners. The Customs Service aims to collect a total of $60 billion in tariffs this year. With mercury levels in some parts of the country expected to reach close to 40 degrees Celsius today, authorities are closely monitoring the nation's demand for electricity. The Korea Power Exchange says electricity demand will likely hover around 76 million kilowatts between 2 and 3 p.m., forcing the reserve level to dip below 2 million kilowatts. At that level, authorities will issue the second highest alert or level 4 warning. The government has banned the use of air conditioning systems in public offices until Wednesday and has advised businesses to temporarily halt 
or reduce operations during peak energy consumption hours in the afternoon. Thanks to the nation's active participation in the nationwide power saving campaign, some 2 million kilowatts of electricity was conserved on Monday. So how can we as individuals participate in the ongoing energy saving campaign? Our Kim Min-ji has some advice on easy but effective ways to save energy at home and at work. Demand for electricity is expected to top 80 million kilowatts this week, with the power used for cooling appliances accounting for about 20 million kilowatts of the total amount. Of these cooling appliances, the majority is consumed by air conditioners, which means the amount you avoid using at home will be a key factor in determining how much energy you can save. Experts say that up to 85 watts can be saved per household by turning off the air conditioner for just 30 minutes between the peak hours of 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. and switching to alternative options of using fans or ice packs instead. Let's take a look at other sources that eat up energy in your household. A vacuum cleaner sucks up an average of 1,182 watts of energy when cleaning. The washing machine, which runs for about an hour each time, also consumes up to 116 watts. So it's better to do your laundry all at once and avoid the peak hours. Moreover, you can save up to 35 watts with your electric rice cooker by switching off the thermal function. But it's office buildings and factories that make up for the bulk of energy consumption as they account for more than half of the country's total power needs. Machines are often left on even when not in use, resulting in the waste of energy. Factories are advised to disconnect the power supply to machinery on standby and to spend air conditioning from time to time during 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. The Korea Electric Power Corporation plans to visit companies nationwide this week to encourage power-saving measures. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. South Korea's top nuclear envoy Cho Tae-yong will meet his Russian counterpart Igor Morgulov in Moscow on Wednesday for talks that will center around North Korea. According to Seoul's foreign ministry, the two officials will discuss the security situation here on the Korean peninsula and ways to resume the long-stalled six-party denuclearization talks. The six-party talks involving the two Koreas, the U.S., China, Japan and Russia have been at a standstill since late 2008. Despite only taking office in May, Cho has already met with his counterparts from the other six-party member nations to discuss ways to deal with Pyongyang's nuclear ambitions. Korean-American Kenneth Bae, who is detained in North Korea, has pleaded with the U.S. government to help him get out of the communist state. After losing more than 20 kilograms and reportedly suffering from a range of health problems, the 45-year-old tour operator and Christian missionary has been moved from his prison camp to a hospital in Pyongyang. In an interview with a Japan-based pro-North Korean newspaper, Joseon Shinbo, Pe asked Washington to actively urge Pyongyang to immediately release him. He was arrested in November and sentenced to 15 years of hard labor in May on charges of attempting to overthrow the regime. The U.S. State Department says the welfare and safety of U.S. citizens is its utmost priority and that it continuously urges Pyongyang for PES amnesty and immediate release. North Korea has unveiled its first ever smartphone called Arirang. The news comes despite the fact that North Korean citizens are banned from using cell phone data services. Pyongyang state-run television says North Korean leader Kim Jong-un visited a factory where the smartphones were being assembled. The handset is known to be a touchscreen Android clone with applications and a high-pixel camera. But North Korea analyst Martin Williams speculates the devices are likely being produced in China and then transported across the border so that North Korea can pretend it made them. The South Korean government has decided to purchase aerial refueling tankers and unmanned aerial vehicles to significantly enhance Seoul's military capabilities. Our Kim Hyun-bin has the details. Several F-15 fighter jets are bound for Alaska, but during the long journey, an air refueling tanker accompanies them, filling up their tanks mid-air. After eight hours and seven refuels, the F-15 lands at its designated base. 
The biggest perk of having an aerial refueling tanker is that it can significantly increase air and military operation time. With it, there's no need to fill the tank to its maximum capacity. Instead, the fighter jets can carry more heavy weaponry, increasing its striking power. The South Korean military has been trying to introduce these aerial refueling tankers for nearly 20 years, and now this goal will soon be realized. The Defense Acquisition Program Administration plans to select a contractor by October 2014 and will make its purchase of the four tankers in 2017. The basic strategy to purchase the aerial refueling tankers has been drawn up. We will set up a budget and announce a business proposal at a later date. The administration also announced its preferred bidder for developing medium-altitude unmanned aerial vehicles, also known as drones, so that it can keep a close watch on North Korea's key nuclear facilities as well as military targets. The administration will start negotiations and plans to introduce the drones sometime after 2017. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. For your fill of Korean and international news, join Che Yu Sun and Mark Broom every weekday at lunchtime. Newsline at noon. Session this Wednesday and vote on the government restructuring bills. One of the world's largest automakers, General Motors, is reportedly beginning to cut its reliance on Korea for the manufacturing of its vehicles. Rising labor costs and regional instability are thought to have helped GM make its latest decision. Achim Gil reports. General Motors seems to have a second thought in its manufacturing operations here in Korea. Currently, one-fifth of all GM vehicles are built in Korea, and more than 80 percent of GM cars made in Korea are exported. GM took over failed local automaker Daewoo Motors in 2002. Over the next 10 years, Korea established itself as one of GM's main production hubs. However, according to a Reuters report Monday, the American auto company may gradually have begun reducing its presence in Korea. Citing sources within GM, the report says rising labor costs, military-like unionism, and geopolitical tensions in the region prompted the U.S. automaker to shift production of its newer models away from Korea. Late last year, GM told the Korean labor union that it would not produce the next-generation Chevrolet Cruze here. It also said it plans to shift a large chunk of production of the Opel Mokka to Spain from the second half of 2014. GM Korea's labor unions believe talk of GM reducing its presence in Korea is a bluff designed to prevent workers seeking further pay hikes. However, some labor union leaders have told Reuters under the condition of anonymity that GM might be planning to permanently shut down all its facilities in Korea. Kim young Arirang News. Major technology media outlets have announced Apple will unveil its next iPhone model on September 10th. Samsung is also set to unveil the next version of its Galaxy Note early September. Not only that, LG has rolled out its latest smartphone just last week, setting the stage for a heated battle between major smartphone makers. Our Yudian has more. Smartphone shoppers will have a new line of top models to choose from major handset manufacturers come this fall. Apple is expected to unveil its new iPhone model on September 10th, a day before the IFA Consumer Electronics Show ends in Berlin, according to technology blog All Things D. The new iPhone model comes about a year after Apple introduced the iPhone 5 last September. While there are no details out on the new iPhone, market watchers say it will have the iOS 7, which has a whole new look for the iPhone menus and icons. As for new exclusive features, analysts have brought up the possibility of a home button that has a fingerprint sensor embedded within it. The new smartphone also may be Apple's first lower-end handset, reflecting Apple's efforts to target price-sensitive consumers as demand for high-end smartphones begins to shrink. Now, Samsung Electronics is also expected to roll out a new smartphone, its Galaxy Note 3, at the IFA Consumer Electronics Show on September 4th, just about a week before Apple's big iPhone announcement.
The Galaxy Note 3 is expected to be the first smartphone with 3 gigabytes of RAM, as all the smartphones previously only had 2 gigabytes. A greater RAM capacity will allow the Note 3 to have faster processing, along with enhanced multitasking capabilities. Meanwhile, LG Electronics recently unveiled its latest smartphone, the G2, just last week, signaling the opening of a three-way battle in the coming months. When taking a look at global market share of these three major players, Samsung and LG have seen their market share grow in the last two quarters, while Apple saw its portion shrink in comparison. The competition is only expected to get fiercer in the coming months, as Samsung tries to maintain its position as industry leader, while LG will move to play catch-up with Apple. Yurian, Arirang News. It looks like a struggling smartphone maker BlackBerry is ripe for picking as it is considering putting itself up for sale. The Canadian company says it has set up a committee to review its options that include joint ventures, partnerships or an outright sale. BlackBerry has been unable to compete with the likes of Samsung and Apple and the firm's new BlackBerry 10 smartphones failed to excite consumers. According to figures released by smartphone market analyst IDC last week, BlackBerry's market share has collapsed from close to 50 percent in the U.S. in 2009 to less than 3 percent this year. Yet another worrying development is Japan's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Ten workers at the plant were found on Monday to have been exposed to small amounts of radiation while conducting cleanup activities. The plant's operator TEPCO says an alarm sounded at a dust monitor near the building, signaling potentially high concentrations of radioactive particles. TEPCO says it's still investigating the exact cause of the alarm, but some experts say it might have been set off by radioactive dust. After receiving full body scans, small amounts of radiation were found on the workers' faces and hair. The contamination is the latest complication to arise at the plant which suffered a meltdown following a massive earthquake and subsequent tsunami in March 2011. The Obama administration is seeking to eliminate some mandatory minimum drug sentences to remedy what it thinks are long and unjust prison terms dished out to non-violent drug offenders. Unveiling the proposals in San Francisco on Monday, Attorney General Eric Holder said too many Americans go to prison for too long and for no good reason. Under Holder's plans, prosecutors would be able to ensure nonviolent defendants without any serious criminal history would be able to get much lighter sentences. He said it was unjust to condemn offenders to years, even decades behind bars, for the possession of a small amount of drugs. Despite the political turmoil in the Middle East and North Africa, international investors with discerning eyes see the region as a land of opportunity. In fact, many companies in the crisis plague region outperformed their rivals in politically stable economies. Our Song Jong-in has the details. The Middle East and North Africa is a region best known as a trouble spot. A deepening political divide between Islamists and secularists, terrorist attacks, toppling of governments and civil wars in the region constantly grab headlines in the media. But for investors who are not carried away by the headlines and focusing on fundamental values and performances, the area offers lucrative investment opportunities. Even in Egypt, the scene of long political uncertainties, now suffering from the ousting of President Mohamed Morsi last month, has seen its stocks go up by 3 percent this year. That compares with a fall of about 10 percent in the MSCI Emerging Markets Index, a benchmark for emerging markets. If you're nervous about such symbols of political instability as Egypt and Syria, look for neighboring nations such as Abu Dhabi and Qatar, whose stock markets soared by between 65 percent and 25 percent in 2013. In fact, governments of many Gulf nations have been increasing spending to prevent political unrest, creating a consumer boom in those economies. Qatar boasts bountiful gas deposits, but spending ahead of the 2022 World Cup it will be hosting means there will be a lot of opportunities in the country's non-energy sectors. 
In oil-rich Saudi Arabia, foreign investors are expected to benefit from a widely expected plan to reform its stock market, especially after it recently shifted its weekend from Thursday and Friday to the regional standard of Friday and Saturday. So if you can locate efficiently run companies, don't let headlines screaming political strife get in the way of reaping handsome profits. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Okay, very hot, very sunny, and very uncomfortable <laughs> is pretty much the weather at the moment in South Korea. And we're going to get an update to see if we're going to get some relief from this heat with our weather caster, Lee Ji-yeon, who's standing by at the weather center. Hello there, ji -yeon. Well, good afternoon, guys. I know it's another sweltering day today, but before I get to the weather, let's talk about something interesting. Uh, today is the seventh day of seventh month in the lunar calendar, also called the double seventh day. So it might sound like a super lucky day, but it's actually considered to be China's Valentine's Day. Right. Well, I think the weather is pretty interesting too, mm -hmm. of course. But um, <laughs> the yeah, I can't say I've ever heard of this double seven day before. Mm, me neither. Have you? Me neither. And I wonder how they celebrate Valentine's Day in China. Um, I heard just before coming in to the for the news today that a lot of them, a lot of couples try to get married on mm. this day, or even just to get their marriage license on the the double seventh day. Mm, that's interesting. Well, whether they are heading out to either get married or register for their marriage license, I hope the weather doesn't stop them from doing so because China is also going through a scorching heat wave this year. And speaking of heat waves in Korea, the blistering August heat has yet to come. Come to an end, but since the my book, the day marking of the last of three hottest days in Korea has passed, it shouldn't get any worse. But hot and humid condition will continue for the time being. And as we can see, the heat wave warning and advisor will continue to be issued across much of the country. So please be cautious about your health. One of the things that we could do is try to avoid a caffeinated drinks and soda and replace them with cool, fresh water. Now the weather today looks. Looks like it will pretty much repeat itself tomorrow. The sun will be shining down strong in the afternoon, sending temperatures into mid 30s across the nation. Well, right now we are looking at clear skies and sun is out in much of the country, with a 75% of humidity this afternoon, making for a sticky and steamy day. So let's take a look at those readings. And if you have noticed, uh, we are having a similar weather condition as yesterday. The capital. And Busan will jump up to 33 degrees Celsius. That's 91 degrees Fahrenheit. And it looks like sizzling heat waves will continue to sweep much of Daegu and Gwangju, and temperatures heating up to 37 and 36. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like Jeju is expected to be slightly cooler than yesterday at 33, while Daejeon, Dokdo, and Mount Kungan will be topping out at 34. Now that's all for Korea, and here's the global forecast for viewers around the world. That's all for me today. Make sure you stay safe and hydrated. Have a wonderful rest of the day. And back to you, Mark and Yusan in the studio. Well, thank you ever so much, as always, Gian. And those are the stories we're following at this hour. Stay with us, of course, for the latest on the, the power shortage alert. Hopefully, we don't have any blackouts, right, mm, Yusan? Hope not. Well, join us again tomorrow here in Seoul at noon, Korea time.